Good afternoon. My name is Eilish Barry. I'm Chief Executive of FLAC, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first session on the courts, uh, the first breakout session on the courts and legal professionals. I would like to thank the, the NDA for putting on such an impressive conference on such a, a range of important issues. The range of topics and, spe and speakers is phenomenal, which I'm not really surprised given Kieran Finley's uh, involvement. It would be great to attend each session, but it is impossible to do so. But there's no need to miss out as each presentation are going to be uploaded to the NDA website uh, after this event. FLAC's aim is to promote access to justice, which of, of course includes access to the courts, which are fundamental to the administration of justice. There's no point having legal advice, legal information and legal aid if you can't actually access the courts. Through FLAC's public interest law project, PILA, Robbie Sinnott, a man with a visual disability, was given legal representation in his High Court challenge in relation to his right to exercise his secret ballot. He recounts how difficult his litigation was uh, when he was cross-examined in relation to documents he simply couldn't access. We also represented Joan Clark in her High Court challenge to the refusal to let her serve on a jury and she featured in the video library there over lunchtime and I think this it's also available to participants. FLAC is also carrying out research into the public sector equality and human rights duty uh, that is imposed by virtue of section 42 of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Act and it's imposed on bodies like the courts and the Workplace Relations Commission. This mandatory statutory duty requires the court services and the Workplace Relations Commission to ca in carrying out their functions to have regard to the need to eliminate discrimination and to promote equality of opportunity and human rights in relation to their service users. If it was implemented properly, it would have an, a significant impact on improving accessibility for people with disabilities and others. We also made a submission to the review of the administration of civil justice, which is being carried out by the former president of the High Court. A report on that review is about to be issued in the next few weeks, and our submission contained recommendations about improving access to the courts for people with disabilities. I'm been, I am absolutely honoured to be asked to chair such a great lineup of speakers. We have three speakers. The bios are in their programme and given that the programme is so packed, I would refer you to, to their bios rather than read them out. Each speaker has been asked to speak for 13 minutes and there is a facility for questions and answers. If you look at the right hand side of your screen, you can ask questions using this function and I would encourage you to do so. I want to remind each speaker to put on their mute button and to do not as I've practiced, but to remember to speak slowly uh, so that the ISL interpreters, Lisa and Vanessa, uh, and the real, cap real time captioning team will be able to keep up. I would also remind everyone that this session is being recorded as well. I will go to our first speaker now, Angus Cleary. He is inquiry head rapid response and investigations of the UK Equality and Human Rights Commission. And he will be speaking about access and participation issues in court modernization processes and digital, just, digital justice. Over to you, Angus. Hi, Alice, thank you very much for that. Um, if I can just start with a quick anecdote. Um, <clears throat> we're working with a, an organization called Transform Justice, and they've been monitoring the courts since the lockdown. And as I'm sure you'll all be aware, a lot of hearings have moved to virtual hearings online. Now they, they have witnessed a very chaotic situation. And just one anecdote, um, a defendant was up in front of the judge um, and there was some confusion about who the defendant was. So the judge turned to the defendant's lawyer, who was on another video screen, to ask if this was indeed their client. And the, the, the lawyer did not know. He did not know if that was his client. And I think that speaks volumes about how uh, virtual justice um, is disadvantaging all defendants, but I think in particular, um, those with disabilities or impairments. And this is where we focused our, um, our inquiry. We launched an inquiry in the spring 
if we can move on to the first slide, um, looking at the impact of court modernization and digital justice on disabled people. Um, and the particular focus of, of that was around participation. Could defendants understand and be understood um, in the process um, and effectively and if, if effectively engage um, in the criminal justice procedures? Um, so if I just speak a moment about the EAHRC, if I can just if you can switch on to the next slide. Um, we are the British um, Equality and Human Rights Commission, so we, we cover England, Wales and Scotland. Uh, we're a national human rights A rated institution. And we have the powers to carry out wide ranging inquiries. And in the spring, we concluded our inquiry. Um, and published our results and the inquiry report was entitled um, Inclusive Justice, a system designed for all. So we had long standing concerns about the ability of dis uh, disabled um, defendants um, to participate in proceedings. Um, England and Wales has, has on, on, undergone a, a very rapid reform process um, with digital and virtual hearing um, being introduced. And in Scotland, um, they're in a slightly different place. Uh, as people will probably know, it's a very different legal system there. But actually the pandemic has very much um, brought them together because this has been a massive rush to, to um, install video facilities and, and virtual systems. So if we come on to the next slide about our inquiry, um, we looked at disabled pe people's experiences in the criminal justice system. So we, we know that people with cognitive impairments, mental health conditions, and neurodiverse conditions are overrepresented um, in the criminal justice system. Um, and that covers a massive range of conditions, things like um, learning disability, um, acquired brain injury, um, bipolar, all sorts of different conditions. Um, and they're very rarely picked up. So the first issue was to look at identification. Now we looked at the pre-trial phase when people come from police custody uh, into the pre-trial pre phase. But of course, it's also the job of the police to screen and to try and pick up those people, particularly with the so-called hidden disabilities, um, whether the defendants have impairments and whether they would need adjustments um, to enable them to understand what is going on and to be able to communicate. So we also looked at the barriers to providing these adjustments and what can be done to make improvements and the particular impact of court modernization. So if we can move on to the next slide to talk about um, access and participation. Um, now we found real issues identifying defendants needs and we came across a really interesting pilot in Kent, which is um, uh, a county just below London. And as a, as a trial, they had screened everybody coming into police custody and they weren't screened by the custody sergeant, which is a normal process. They were screened by a health professional. And those health professionals um, met them confidentiality and took them through quite a complex um, screening process. And they picked up around four times more um, impairments and disabilities than the standard screening process. Unfortunately, that study wasn't robust enough to publish those figures as concrete figures. So we're urging the government to do a more concrete example, but the a more concrete pilot. But the, um, there were particular conditions that seemed to be missed the most. Um, learning disability was often missed and often because people didn't think it was relevant to the crime or to the proceedings but obviously it's extremely relevant to somebody giving their best defense we also found that the um, one of the there are many adjustments that can be made in the criminal proceedings uh, very simple ones such as speaking slowly and using simple language um, to having an intermediary uh, which is a a trained normally a trained speech therapist who effectively translates the language in the court into very short and easy to understand sentences. Now these are very common for witnesses and there's been a huge increase for their use with witnesses um, in the English and Welsh courts 
but they're increasingly rarely used um, for defendants. Um, and also there's been a massive increase in the use of virtual hearings. This is before the pandemic. So the way that it, we looked very closely at those on remand in prison, the way it works is they get a 15 minute slot with their lawyer prior to their first hearing. And if you think about what has to happen in that slot, the, their lawyer has to be confident that they've understood charges against them, um, that they can take instruction, that they um, can advise them on, on how to plead. Um, and often those 15 minute slots uh, are the first meeting with the lawyer. It, it, it can be on, on quite a shaky kind of um, line or the, the quality isn't very good. And often you don't get 15 minutes anyway because the, the tech is, I'm sure we're all familiar with video conferences. It takes a couple of minutes to set up and get everybody there. Um, and it really disadvantages those who have um, comprehension or, or issues or, or, or perhaps issues with communication. Um, and that's an awful lot of people we believe in the criminal justice system. So the, given the kind of the profile of the people going into the criminal justice system, um, the system is simply not designed around their needs. Um, and often when, when information is picked up about somebody's disability, that is not passed through the system, so adjustments aren't made. So we found that the existing framework to secure effective participation um, for disabled defendants was generally inadequate. And in, the other very interesting point was the legal professionals themselves. We had some very interesting comments from some magistrates who said you can instantly tell if a lawyer has, had, has been working in the youth system because they are trained to deal with so-called vulnerable defendants. Um, now, they treat, tend to treat, treat their clients very differently, much more kind of sympathetic, engage uh, in a way that they're much more likely to understand. Um, and on the whole, uh, the training for lawyers to deal with um, disabled defendants um, is, is very hit and miss. There are very, very few who get training and they generally have to do that off their own back. So if we, if we can move to the slide of benefits of participation, um, there are three broad benefits. The accused, or the, def the, the um, is the Scottish term, the defendant themselves sees the process as fairer. Even if they're convicted, um, they see the process as fairer and um, because they feel that they have had their say and they have been able to engage in the legal process. Um, and there is also some evidence to say that there's better compliance with court orders when they feel that they've had a fair hearing. For the victims and witnesses, it's clearly better um, because they get a sense of justice. There's nothing worse for, for a victim um, to see a defendant completely unable to engage in proceedings. And ultimately, of course, it, it's a much better guarantor of a fair trial and a fair outcome. So in, in, it's a common law principle that defendants or accused people must be able to be understand and be involved in criminal proceedings. And it's also a right under the human right. It's also a, a right under the Human Rights Act. Um, so the sort of things we're talking about um, is they need to be able to explain their version of events, understand what they've been charged with, understand the case and evidence against them, understand the defences and the options available to them, understand the written communication, have a general general understanding of the trial process and critically can give their best evidence. Um, and also understand the significance of any penalties they face or the requirements of out-of-court disposals. Um, so coming on to the last slide, key recommendations. Um, we have made a recommendation that from the Kent model that everybody is screened um, by a health professional um, coming into custody. Um, there are health professionals embedded in all English custody suites now, they're called liaison diversion services, um, and they're in a very good position to do this, so the infrastructure exists. Much better information sharing, so that when information is picked up, it's actually passed through the whole criminal justice journey about people's, in, um, what adjustments they need. Um, registered intermediaries, as I mentioned, are increasing. They, they are registered for the witnesses, but not defendants. So we need an equivalence for defendants. And generally make some accessible, information accessible um, for all those going through the systems. And we saw some very good examples of easy read materials or other materials in custody suites and elsewhere, but these have not been rolled out nationally. In 
Importantly, it's important that there's some flexibility around video hearings, but for some defendants, they're simply not suitable. They, they really struggle to engage um, and they really struggle um, um, to effectively participate. And they would need a face-to-face -face hearing if they were engaged properly. And much, much better uh, monitoring analysis of data. So the big picture is, as we mentioned, they need to design the system around the needs of people with disabilities and, and really assess some of the reforms that have already gone through, which they haven't done for their impact. Um, almost all the criminal justice professionals that we interviewed um, were very critical of the use of video hearings um, and it reduces the opportunity to um, uh, engage defendants. Um, we have had very constructive conversations with, with government. The Secretary of State um, has a disabled son and that may have given us a very sympathetic hearing. So we haven't got concrete measures yet, but all, the, all that we're seeing out of the Ministry of Justice seems that they're taking our recommendations very seriously. And we are genuinely optimistic that some of our recommendations at least be taken forward in part. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ancus, and thank you for coming in within time, um, which is great. Um, I just remind uh, our participants that there is a chat function for uh, answering questions on the right hand part of your screen, so I'd encourage you to use that. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Brona Byrne. She's senior lecturer in the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work in Queen's University. She will be speaking on the topic of legal professions supporting deaf people's access to the justice system. Thank you, Brona. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Good. Um, this afternoon, I want to present the findings of a recent research project in the context of Northern Ireland, which examined the implementation of Article 13 of the CIPD in ter terms of effective access for deaf people. If we move on to the next slide. The report has been produced as part of a wider co-produced project with the British Deaf Association in Northern Ireland and a deaf advisory group. We also had an academic team of three researchers, myself from Queen's University in Belfast, along with two researchers from Syracuse University in New York, who specifically work on access to justice for deaf people. This project was part of a larger UK-wide funding initiative from the Big Lottery Disability Research on Independent Living and Learning. And it's just we wanted to provide research that other regions of the UK could build on and learn from. The study was a two-year pilot project between 2017 and 2019, and it's based on existing research that has been carried out by the British Deaf Association, as well as research by other members of the research team. And those pieces of research looked at access to justice from the perspective of deaf people themselves. The next slide. Given that the perspectives of deaf people in Northern Ireland had already been examined, it was decided that in this project, we would focus on the perspectives and experiences of duty bearers across the justice system. The aims of the project were to explore what duty bearers or legal professionals already knew about deaf people's engagement and experiences with the legal system. What levels of awareness did they already have? We wanted to identify ways in which they could better support deaf people's access to the justice system and to identify training and resource needs that they could draw on. 
we use this research and the, the findings from the research as a basis to co-produce training sessions or information sessions by legal professionals across Northern Ireland. And we conducted about 15 information sessions with 151 legal professionals. Next slide. In contrast to traditional research, we very much focus on securing rights holders, in this context, deaf people, as the project leads and advisors rather than research subjects. Our deaf advisory group provided insight into the research design, what kind of questions we should ask, who we should interview, and what our recommendations should be. So they were very much positioned as expert advisors on the basis of our underlying principle, nothing about us without us. Next slide. In total, we spoke to 35 legal professionals across the justice system, ranging from solicitors, barristers, police officers, prison officers, judges, and tribunal members. So what I want to do now, if we move on to the next slide, I to present some of our research findings. We have a huge amount of rich and very valuable data. And if you see from the next slide, we identified key, six key themes alongside our deaf advisory group. So these were the themes that they pulled out in particular and felt was particularly important. For reasons of time, um, we're going to focus on the first two themes today. If we move to the next slide. And those are the legal professionals' experiences of working with deaf people and accessing services in the justice system. There are a range of other issues as well, and you're very welcome to look at those in more detail in our full report which you'll be able to find on the virtual platform and also through the link at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. It was very clear that legal professionals in the study had limited experience of working with deaf people. That included those working in police service, um, in the judiciary, as barristers and solicitors, and included those with a career of over 30 years to date. Feedback suggests that there seems to be a comparatively high level of underreporting of crimes and incidents from the deaf community and underutilization of legal advice services. Not necessarily because there are no crimes or incidents to report, but because of, among other factors, a lack of sustained interaction with the deaf community. One judge that we spoke to said that, by doing this, you've triggered that thought in my mind. I've been a barrister for 30 years and a high court judge for three years, and I have not had a deaf person appear in front of me. I haven't been asked to represent a deaf person. So I'm asking myself the question now, is there a problem even before they get to court? Next slide. One police officer who was also about to retire also spoke of the fact that they had never had any contact with a deaf person, despite living in an area where there was a relatively large deaf community. One police officer confessed to feeling quite distressed that a deaf person who lived quite close to a police station in Northern Ireland, contacted the police station in England because it was the only accessible way that they could do this through an interpreter service that wasn't available in Northern Ireland. Next slide. Where legal professionals were working with deaf people, there was a lack of understanding and awareness or misunderstanding around how to communicate with and engage with interpreters. A tribunal panel member talked about how he thought that involving interpreters would mean that the process would be quite slow 
and that would mean he would be able to take notes. But actually, in the situation he was involved with, where there were two deaf people, but one used Irish sign language and one used British sign language, that it was a very complex process and required much time and consideration. Next slide. The ability of deaf people to access services was hampered by a wide range of barriers. And one of these was the, the assumption that if you provide information in written format or online, that this would automatically be accessible to the deaf community. However, actually the police officer found that in talking to some deaf people, that they said it was too heavy on text. It assumes quite a high standard of literacy. The education system, as you've been finding out, has let a lot of deaf people down. The standard of education they've received is poor. Next slide. There was acknowledgement that solicitors and barristers and members of the judiciary were increasingly aware that deaf people needed interpreters to engage with court cases. However, there were a number of incidents where Interpreters had only been booked to engage with aspects of the court case where the deaf person themselves was communicating or talking. And once the deaf person had finished talking, there was an assumption that interpreters should then leave and didn't need to be involved in the rest of the process. So this highlights the importance of ensuring that interpreters aren't simply booked for a particular time slot but are actually retained to try and see what other people are saying relating to the deaf person's case. Next slide. So that's a very broad summary of some of the key findings from our research project. Um, and it was very apparent that the, the legal system has been designed by and for hearing people and not designed with deaf people in mind. Rethinking what a justice system looks like, what an inclusive justice system looks like, and challenging these so-called natural practices is an important exercise in ensuring a system that reflects the 21st century and that is also compliant with Article 13 of the UNCRPD. The Deaf Advisory Group that we work with co-produce a range of resources and you can see some tips there that they've highlighted and turned into a resource for legal professionals to use. They also design resources around how to book a sign language interpreter when needed and developed a series of short videos and role plays, both for legal professionals and for deaf people to use to find out more about the justice system. Next slide, please. So I will leave it there for now, but please do feel free to access the full report and to get in touch with me if you need any more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brona. I loved the idea of reimagining an inclusive uh, justice system, I suppose. Um, my view would be that the justice system is designed by lawyers for use by lawyers. <laughs> so it's, I think it's really important to put the, the litigation at the, the litigant at the heart of uh, the justice system with all, with all their diversity. So, so thank you for that, uh, Brona, really um, interesting uh, uh, question. Uh, and we'll, we'll move on now to our last speaker, um, Dr. Alan, Alan Cusack, who's a lecturer in law at uh, Limerick University who will be addressing the topic of evidential barriers faced by persons uh, with disabilities. Uh, off you go, Alan, thank you very much. Great, um, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, as you'll see from the title of my presentation, my paper today will focus on how witnesses with disabilities, and uh, perhaps more specifically, how witnesses with intellectual disabilities give evidence in criminal proceedings in Ireland. And I'll be placing very heavy emphasis in my paper over the next 15 minutes um, on a range of courtroom supports or what we call special measures that exist 
um, within the Irish criminal justice system to facilitate giving evidence um, at trial. Um, to set my paper in context, it's worth pointing out that for over 25 years, Ireland's special measures landscape, so those courtroom supports remained unchanged and um, static. Um, and it was only really since 2017, we've seen this area gain a political traction and there've been no fewer than three legislative interventions in this area since 2017. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, against that backdrop, my paper today has two primary concerns. My first concern is simply to provide you with an overview um, of Ireland's special measures landscape. And then in the second half of my presentation, I hope to identify some outstanding barriers, which I believe continue to prejudice efforts aimed at securing the best evidence of witnesses with intellectual disabilities um, in courts in Ireland. So if we go to the next slide, please, and we can actually move on again to the next slide. So we're going to um, begin by explaining Ireland's special measures framework. And I, I think the first significant statutory intervention in the direction of recognizing and responding to the uh, unique needs of witnesses with intellectual disabilities can be traced back to the Criminal Evidence Act, which was passed in 1992. Um, so this piece of legislation actually had its genesis in a report from the Law Reform Commission in 1990. And you'll see in the slide here in the quote that the Law Reform Commission recommended that any supports, testimonial supports for child witnesses should be made available on an equal basis for witnesses with intellectual disabilities. So uh, the quote was any special legislative arrangements facilitating the giving of evidence by children by the use of CCTV, video recordings and skilled examiners should also apply in cases of sexual offences against uh, persons suffering from a mental handicap or suffering from mental illness. So that um, recommendation was accepted by Irish policymakers. And two years later, the Criminal Evidence Act placed special measures on a statutory footing in Ireland for the first time. So under the 1992 Act, two types of witnesses could now benefit from supports in court. Children on the one hand, and persons with a mental handicap. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so in the slide, you can see the types of measures that were introduced. There was a presumption that um, such witnesses could use TV uh, link to give evidence. There was um, uh, provision made for the use of intermediaries, for uh, pre-recording evidence in chief and for moving wigs and gowns. So in the context of the kind of mainstream or ableist focus of Ireland's criminal trial up to 1992, these measures were certainly very welcome. However, there are certain disadvantages or problems associated with the 1992 Act, and we can see the first of those in the next slide. So the first issue with the 1992 Act is that it enforces a very strict eligibility criteria. Um, so for instance, all of those supports that I just spoke about, TV link, the use of intermediaries, um, pre-recording evidence in chief, they're only available to prosecution witnesses. So an accused person who's an intellectual disability in Ireland has no legal right to access those supports, even though they may be available to prosecution witnesses. That's one problem. The second problem is that even for prosecution witnesses, it's only certain types of witnesses that will get the support of these measures. Um, you have to be a witness in a sexual or violent case to access um, the supports under the 1992 Act. So um, this again were, was to be criticised and the Home Office in England expressly rejected the idea of having an offence gateway to access these supports. And you can see the quote here. Um, a witness was either vulnerable or he or she was not. The offence was only relevant to the extent that it helped to inform an assessment of vulnerability. So that was one major criticism of the 1992 Act was its limited focus. A second criticism, which is on the next slide, is that those measures or the legislation was designed to meet the testimonial needs of children as opposed to being designed in contemplation of the specific needs of witnesses with intellectual disabilities. Um, and this is something that Claire Edwards has been critical of. Um, so Claire spoke this morning, but in a report in 2012, she said that many of these measures, they were first introduced to assist children as witnesses and whilst there has been growing recognition of people with disabilities as vulnerable witnesses, it is still the case that there has been considerably more emphasis and indeed research on special measures as they apply to children. So after the 1992 Act, as I said, this area 
was neglected by policymakers for 25 years. Um, but, but if we go to the next slide, please, you'll see that this um, policy of neglect came to an abrupt end in 2017. Um, and in 2017, the Sexual Offences Act was passed. And this, again, wrought further changes for Ireland's special measures framework. It's important clearly to point out here that the amendments to Ireland's special measures, again, were made in the context of meeting the needs of children. So if you look at the explanatory memorandum, it says that these amendments were aimed at rendering the justice system less formal and more sensitive for child victims of sexual abuse. So again, what we see is the emphasis has been on the needs of children as opposed to witnesses with intellectual disabilities. Um, and to meet the needs of children, um, the special measures that were envisaged were threefold, that we would now recognize restrictions on when an accused could cross-examine a witness, um, screens were to be introduced into the Irish trial, and we were also to expand the situations when evidence could be pre-recorded um, for evidence in chief. Those latter two reforms, if we go to the next slide, please, never came into force. So really the only legacy of the Sexual Offences Act was the restrictions that it introduced on when an accused could personally cross-examine a witness. So if we go to the next slide, and actually to the next slide again, thank you. Um, we're beginning to see here that um, even that measure um, in terms of restricting when an accused can personally cross-examine a witness um, was not uh, complete and there's grounds to be critical of it. So for instance, when you look at the provision, only child witnesses to a sexual or a violent offence are presumed to be protected from being cross-examined by an accused. An adult witness is not entitled uh, to apply for this measure. Indeed, an adult witness with an intellectual disability can only apply to be protected against being cross-examined by the accused where they are the alleged victim and it has to be a victim of a sexual offence. So if you are an adult um, with an intellectual disability and you've been the victim of a violent offence, for instance, you're not entitled to apply for this protection. So again, this is a very limited um, restriction on the use of this special measure. And again, it's in contrast with the approach in England and Wales. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, the, the Sexual Offences Act was obviously important because it came after 25 years of neglect. But just a number of months later, we also had a second piece of legislation, the Victims of Crime Act from 2017. Um, and this also introduced changes to our special measures. Um, the, this act, the Victims of Crime Act, was introduced to give effect to the Victims Directive. Um, but if we move to the next slide, I want to focus on the procedural changes that this act um, introduced. So in looking at special measures, the key change here was that the legislation removed the reference to mental handicap, persons with a mental handicap. Now, in order to be eligible for special measures, you had to be either a child or a person with a mental disorder. It also introduced an entirely new category of witnesses who were seen to also be entitled to support in court. So beyond children and persons with a mental disorder, you now had a category known as victims who have special protection needs. And if you were a victim with a special protection need, um, you could ask to have the benefit of TV link testimony and intermediary or screens with you in, in court. So again, um, this was a very welcome um, development in terms of recognizing um, the very damaging language that had been uh, used in the 1992 Act and also in terms of ex expanding the measures that existed in Ireland. So if we move to the next slide, please, I just want to focus in the final slides on some of the outstanding barriers um, that continue to prejudice efforts at securing best evidence uh, in court. Um, the first issue is the, um, the complexity of this area of law. So in a report in 2013, it was recommended that a special measures package should be created for vulnerable witnesses as distinct from a range of ad hoc measures that can be applied inter alia to vulnerable witnesses. And I would suggest that at a policy level, the two recent acts represent a missed opportunity to realize this reform, reformative ambition. Indeed, by introducing two further pieces of legislation with overlapping provisions, um, the recent developments have actually created further confusion in this area. Uh, and these amendments have been described by Liz Heffernan as creating a legal labyrinth. 
And the confusion obviously brings with it certain very important risks. Um, firstly, there's a risk now that special measures will be misunderstood. There's also a risk that this confusion will give grounds for appealing convictions. And also, when you look at the recent changes, adults with intellectual disabilities are now treated less favorably than other, we'll say, potentially vulnerable witnesses, such as children. So if we go to the next slide, and the next slide, please. You can start to see here three areas where child witnesses are treated more favorably than adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to talk you through another issue with the recent enactments. So not only is the area confused, it is also under uh, resourced. And um, in Ireland, we have no provision at present for allowing pre-trial cross-examination. Um, it remains the case that every witness in Ireland must be available for live oral cross-examination at trial. Um, and Miriam Delhunt has said that we continue to endure a situation in Ireland where our adversarial system risks imposing a secondary trauma on the complainant. Um, and it's particularly regretful that we didn't introduce pretrial cost examination, given that this has been very successful in England and Wales. So a study by the Ministry of Justice has found that pretrial cost examination results in a better experience for witnesses with the cross examination taking place in around half the time compared to other cases, and also showed an increase in early guilty pleas. So on the next slide, you'll see as well that not only do we not have provision for pre-trial cross-examination, there's no provision for pre-trial hearings in Ireland. So again, in England and Wales, it's now quite common to have a ground rules hearing where an intermediary, um, barristers and judges will discuss how to examine a witness in court. Um, we have no, there's no statutory basis for those hearings in Ireland. Um, and this is something that the Rape Crisis Network was critical of in 2018. They said that you can see it here, pre-trial hearings should be placed on a statutory footing. There have been two cases to date in Ireland where courts have held these types of meetings, but it would be much better if this was formalized through uh, legislation. So the final point um, that I want to pick up is on the next slide. And that relates to the, um, the attitudes of the legal professionals in Ireland who act as gatekeepers for these supports. So there is some evidence to suggest um, that, uh, that, there are, uh, that there's a reluctance amongst legal professionals to use the supports that exist. So intermediaries have existed in Ireland since 1992, but the first time we saw one being used in Irish courts was in 2015. And again, in 2018, the Rape Crisis Network were very critical um, of the fact that they're very rarely used in Irish courts. And this raises important questions around the level of disability awareness training within the DPP, the court service, the law society, the bar council, and amongst our judiciary. Okay, so to finish with the final slide, um, I just want to finish by uh, this quote from Benedict and Grant. So they've said that the greatest impediment to accommodating um, complainants with mental disabilities lies in our assumptions about what is necessary to ensure a fair trial for an accused. With ratification of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Irish policymakers have been provided with a unique opportunity to challenge these assumptions in light of the experience of victims with intellectual disabilities. To date, our approach has been to hammer, to quote Diane Birch, to hammer the square peg of the vulnerable witness into the round hole of the adversarial system. And I would suggest that a more ambitious project of procedural reform should be considered now if we wish for our ratification of the convention to be meaningful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. And thank you to um, all of our speakers for um, uh, such fascinating and engaging presentations. And I know you've all packed a huge amount of, uh, of information and, and thought into those presentations. Um, I'm just reminding the people who are attending the, uh, the, the session that um, uh, there is a chat function there, so questions can be answered. And um, uh, the, the one question that has come in that is, is something uh, that I'd, I'd love to hear myself uh, from, from Susie Byrne is the extent to which barristers and solicitors receive professional training uh, in dealing with um, uh, people with disabilities. And perhaps I could ask 
you first uh, that question, Alan, and then perhaps Brona could give her uh, a, a experience in Northern Ireland and um, Angus could tell us the, the situation in, in, in the UK. Thank you very much. I mean, that's a great question by, by Susie. Um, there is some training um, that's now being provided um, uh, by the Law Society um, and the Bar Council does have advocacy training in terms of um, civility uh, in advocacy when, when addressing witnesses. But we don't have training in Ireland to the as, as sophisticated a model of training as exists, we'll say, in England and Wales. So in England and Wales, um, you have the Innsum Court College of Advocacy, which pioneered a really outstanding training program with the Advocates Gateway, which involved training legal professionals um, with respect to um, advocacy techniques, best practice advocacy techniques when dealing with vulnerable witnesses. Um, ideally, that's the type of program that we would like to see rolled out here in Ireland um, through the Bar Council and also through the Law Society of Ireland. Um, one, for anyone who's interested in this area, and if Susie's interested, if you go to the Advocates Gateway website, uh, you will find there a list of toolkits, which are effectively small, concise documents giving clear instructions as to how to deal with different types of witnesses. Um, and again, it, it's true these training initiatives, um, and much of it's been led by um, Professor Penny Cooper in, in England and Wales, that advocates are beginning to adjust their advocacy techniques in contemplation of the needs of witnesses with disabilities. Um, so while we do have some training in Ireland, it's certainly nowhere near as sophisticated as what exists in England and Wales. And also there doesn't seem to be any move in Ireland to introducing ticketing of advocates. So again, in England and Wales, there's this movement towards insisting that only persons who have gone on specific training courses will deal with witnesses with disabilities or child witnesses. Um, and certainly I think there would be a lot of scope to introduce that here in Ireland. Apologies with the technical glitches there. Um, I'm just reading the, the second question, but before we go to it, because I think we have a little bit of, of time, I um, just wanted to ask you, Alan, before going to Brona, um, you mentioned pre-trial cross-examination, and I just wasn't clear what was meant by that and what, what would be involved in it. Great. Um, so so pre-trial cross-examination would effectively mean that the process of being cross-examined by, by the opposing barrister would actually occur in advance of the trial date. So it would occur in um, outside of a courtroom, um, closer to the date of the alleged incident, um, and it would allow uh, the, the cross-examination therefore to be recorded and then played in court. Um, in England and Wales where this uh, was, it, it has a statutory basis under section 28 of the Youth Justice and Criminal Evidence Act in England, but when that was introduced, um, it means that both sides get a chance to, to have the examination done earlier. And if we we'll say there's an issue around disclosure, latent disclosure, so some really important fact comes to light later uh, after that cross-examination has occurred, you would simply re-examine the witness on that specific material point, and you would also record that and have that played in court. There wouldn't be any idea that the accused would be prejudiced through the system. Um, it's just simply a way of, of still having cross-examination, but outside of the formality of the courts. Great. Um, if I can turn to you, Brona, and um, ask you about the, the, the training of legal professionals in Northern Ireland, but I also wanted to just, I suppose, on a, on a practical basis, just from FLAC's experience, we have, we experience quite a degree of difficulty in getting um, Irish Sign Language interpreters. They're incredibly busy. And um, on occasion in court cases or before the W or the Workplace Relations Commission, um, there have been, you know, some of our clients would be concerned about the standard of the translation services. So I'd just be curious uh, to know, Bruno, your views in relation to uh, the training of legal professions in Northern Ireland and then standards around um, interpretation services. Is there, Bruno? 
Um, so, yeah, so just to keep the, the first question around training for legal professionals, um, it's limited training. I think there's a much more developed system in England and Wales. Um, we do have training that is coming out of the EU mental capacity legislation. Um, and we have a limited intermediary system as well. But I think a lot of it is going to be developed and much of it is still through CPD or continuous professional development training. Um, the question around interpreters, um, that was a massive issue within our study. Um, and I think the tension between deaf people requesting interpreters and the legal professional responsible for booking them doing so in a timely manner um, and having that awareness that interpreters need to be booked at least six weeks in advance um, and you can't just simply expect an interpreter to be booked and turn up the next day. Um, so I think there's a lot of awareness raising that needs to be done around that. Um, other issues as well in terms of the standard of interpreters. In Northern Ireland, there's a small number of interpreters who have experience working within the court system um, and they tend to get the most requests, obviously because they're aware of how the court system works um, and are able to engage with it more effectively. But that's a lot of pressure on a very small group of interpreters um, and there's a need for wider training to be offered to more interpreters. Some of the interpreters we spoke to talked about how they would really like more training, more systematic training um, that they weren't currently being provided with. But there was a question around who's responsible for providing that and who's responsible for funding that. Uh, but it's definitely issues to be looked at around training. Even simple things from for legal professionals in terms of how to book a sign language interpreter, um, very few were actually aware. So our deaf advisory group produced a small um, resource, a flowchart of how to actually do that, um, that could then be disseminated among as many legal professionals as possible. So I think those things, little things, also make a difference. Uh, great. Um, that's, that's really helpful. Um, Angus, perhaps you could tell us about the, the training of legal professions in the UK and what we could learn. Well, Alan covered the um, Advocates Gateway very well, mm. and we similarly heard very positive feedback and we spoke to them. Um, a colleague of mine actually went on that and she said it was interesting. I heard this from the Advocates Gateway themselves, that they said that the younger um, barristers were much more uh, receptive to the training than some of the old guard who kind of, because it kind of changed the way you do cross-examination and there was a bit of a resistance, but certainly younger barristers were, were, um, were, did like it. And that's something similar has also been rolled out to the judiciary. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, there's, there's specific training for youth, um, those working in the youth courts, but there's been, um, there's been a suggestion that for those, the young adults under 25, um, it would be would benefit from similar training because they're often very similar age, similar issues. You don't suddenly become mature when you're 18 um, and lots of similar things. So we work very hard to try and find out, you know, how can we improve training for the solicitors across the board? And it was really tricky because, um, as Brona mentioned, there didn't seem to be anybody particularly responsible. The government said it's not us, the Solicitors Regulation Authority said it's not us, and everybody we went to. And they also said that solicitors is those working um, in the public um, sphere, those representing, those working on legal aid, criminal solicitors, is a profession in crisis. There's almost none left under 35. There's nobody joining. The fees are so low. So if we're going to go to them and said, yeah, you need to do this extra training and it's going to cost you, they were like, well, no, hang on. So there's a real, real issue about how we get that delivered. And um, we're asking the government to show leadership on that, but we, we did struggle to find out, um, you know, an effective mechanisms because there's, there, there's such bigger problems that need to be fixed as well. Well, not bigger ones, but you know, there are, there are other issues as well that need to be addressed. 
Yeah, I, I think we're probably having that crisis in criminal legal aid here as well. Um, there's two more questions that have come in and maybe I'll ask uh, each of the panelists to maybe answer the two questions together. Um, Jackie Brown is very interested to hear all of your views on how uh, disabled people can advocate and promote some of the recommendations from this session. And then Louise Lachlan is asking, and it's easy to ask this, but it, it is always of interest, what one action uh, would you take to make access to justice um, more accessible? We'll, we'll start with you, Angus, and, and work back. I would start with where we finished, actually training. I mean, I think if people have got um, understanding and insight, uh, just that comment from the magistrate, you could instantly tell from the lawyer's behaviour with their client whether they'd had training or not. Um, and although we've struggled with it, um, we have found it really frustrating. Um, I think it is, is the most important thing that we need to move forward. And on what, what um, can disabled people or people with disabilities do? I mean, we work, we work very hard with a number of um, organisations, APPGs, advocacy. So I would, I think their voice has become much more powerful over the last couple of years because it's some really, really good work by some of the leading um, kind of organisations and charities in this area. So I would, from what I've seen has had an impact kind of really kind of powerful advocacy targeted at decision makers um, using kind of lived experience. Um, but we all have different ways of influencing. So use any channels we've got of influencing, maybe through the organisations that you represent. And some of the organisations that um, work with disabled people or people with disabilities, I should say, um, were uncomfortable talking about the criminal justice system. They much prefer to focus on victims rather than um, people who might be perpetrators and where their um, disability might be a factor in that. So perhaps um, a conversation within that sphere would be really helpful. Okay, turning to you, Brona, what would your views be on uh, how disabled people can advocate for the changes that all of the panelists are recommending and then to identify one action which you think might make access to justice um, more accessible. I agree with um, Angus's point. I think voice is so important and should never be underestimated if we want to develop a more inclusive justice system. Um, I think for our project, the establishment of a deaf advisory group with deaf people themselves, um, that's that I say, the organisation, and that really had an enormous impact on our project in raising awareness among legal professionals and in getting them involved. Um, we had an, an event where the deaf advisory group invited senior Northern Ireland judges to talk about the exclusion from jury service. Um, and it makes such a difference having that interaction between the judiciary and the deaf advisory group rather than being me as an academic or a researcher or the organisation themselves. Um, and that is it definitely continued. So I would say um, co-production, um, involvement of disabled people and deaf people in these processes need to be absolutely crucial and being mindful of a rights-based approach and what that actually means in practice. Okay, um, thank you so much for that, Brona. Alan, you have one minute. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, that's great. I mean, my, 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 my response would be the same. It would be a culmination of what Brona and Angus have said. I think training is the number one action and it's not an easy action. When we talk about training, it seems like a single solution, but it would involve training court service, judiciary, and Garda Siakana, uh, and uh, barristers and lawyers. So that, that's a big solution to undertake, and it should only be undertaken um, through being informed of the lived experience of disability. So as Brona said, it's really important that any policies that are addressed to meet the needs of persons with disabilities are actually designed in contemplation of their needs. And that needs to be, um, that needs to include the actual voices of persons with disabilities. 
Thank you very much, Alan. And just to thank again our three speakers, Angus, Brown, and Alan, for such uh, excellent, informative, and engaging presentations. And to thank all the tech support and Lisa and uh, Vanessa as well. It would be lovely to give the usual round of applause. So I'm sorry, you just have to imagine a round of applause. And it feels strange not to continue the discussion over coffee. Um, but hopefully sometime we'll be able to have this discussion uh, in more detail on a face-to-face -face basis. So thanks again to Kieran and the NDA for organizing such an interesting conference. And to remind people that the next breakout session will be starting at three. And Kieran Fidney, if you're listening, if you ever want to come back and work again with FLAC, uh, please do so. Okay, thank you very much. We'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>